welcome to Final Fights. I am Mark Hoffmeyer, and joining me is Tom Iron Man Tresemer. Systems are a go. <laughs> That's almost more Optimus Prime than, than anything from Iron Man. Oh, but, you're, so you're only at about 19% right now. Power. I, I feel like I'm at 19%, and it's... <laughs> Going down quick. I'm gonna need a new uh, a new chess piece soon. All systems are. I love it, man. That's great. Well, thank. I just want to say thank you for joining me on this journey here of final fights. I think we're gonna we're gonna be covering a lot of MCU movies in the future here. If there's anything I love, it's final fights. I yeah. love final fights. And the MCU. I mean, we have so we've covered the Hulk. So we have 22 final fights to cover in this series. That's gonna be. I don't. I think it's gonna be fun revisiting these because. While watching this final fight in 2008's Iron Man between Tony Stark and Obadiah Stone, Robert Downey Jr. and Jeff Bridges, with assists from Pepper Potts, Rhodey, and Coulson, you learn where, okay, this was 2008. This is the success of this movie, 94% tomato meter score, 7.9 IMDb, 585 million worldwide. I saw this in Korea in a sold-out movie theater. And so with the success of this movie... It really influenced the final fights from oh, here yeah. on out. And I got to tell you, this final fight, it's its just a CGI smash em up with, you know, you have Chekhov's fly, fly as far as you can go and deal with ice. You know, they did that earlier. And I, mm. I love the opening scene where he tests out his suit and then he learns that and Obadiah hasn't tested that yet. But it's its not thrilling, this battle, right? It's not. It's, no, it's, it's, it's a very interesting final fight because i i clocked it and it's roughly around eight minutes and 30 seconds long long but there isn't a whole lot going on in it no really i mean there's what maybe three punches thrown if that a couple kicks most of it throwing. is most of it's iron monger throwing iron man <laughs> through random buses and hitting him with motorcycles Killing and then a the rather dude. large portion of it is in them flying up in the air yep and a bear hug and a bear hug. And some flares. But it, and then no guidance missiles and machine guns that he can't hit anything with. I gotta say, the the most clumsy part of this fight... And listen, it, so Iron Man's in my top five MCU movies. I think, for me, this movie's more about the, 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 the missile that blows up that tank. For me, this movie's more about escaping the cave, right? Mm -hmm. Or And I think, it, when the more I watch it, when Potts steps into Obadiah's office, he's very threatening in this. When he's talking to his workers, you know, I'm not Tony Stark. We'll make it work. Like, he's he's threatening in this. He's not the dude. He's kind of a badass. But I guess once the problem with Iron Man for me is the finale of two, the finale of three, it just becomes a CGI smash em up, right? Mm -hmm. And I, I do like this one more than maybe the other ones because it's Tony d using his intelligence to win, right? Yeah, hey, I've actually got a note on that that, it ex it exemplifies how creative Stark is when he's fighting, especially when he's overpowered or outgunned. And that's exactly right. It's like Obadiah comes in and he takes Tony's reactor out of his chest, and so Tony's virtually dying. And then he takes it and he, he you know he powers up his own suit, and so Tony's got to get a backup in him. Yep. And it's Tony saves like, his what, life. Well, like twenty percent when he gets it in his chest, yep. and then it's rapidly going down. It's like 19%. finding that. You know, it's like finding that, you know, you've got a remote control for something and it has two AA batteries and one of the AA's is already dead. Mm -hmm. And so then you put the other one in and you know, like, you don't have much time to do anything with it. And so that's like he's he's fighting against a clock of his own power cells, really. Yeah, that's an interesting narrative, too, because 19 and then when he gets to the top, it's 11 percent and then 7 percent. And then, and then he's at he's at two at his descent and then he goes into reserve power. And then so he... I mean, it is it's interesting. Yeah, I mean, I guess story-wise, it, it's more character-driven. How's that? Then you know, we talked about Rob Roy and just mm -hmm. the, the – the, I'm going to say it, the delicious chore choreography. So a stunt, you know, sword choreography in that. We've talked about the fight in Lethal 1 with the jiu-jitsu, the fight between – those are smash them up, break them up, smite. This is more just Tony being smart against yeah. an overconfident foe. No, oh, that's exactly it. right. Yeah. Yeah. I guess it's a good way to start the MCU, but when you look back to Thor, and then you go, uh, sorry, when you go to Hulk, you have the CGI smash him up. And then you go to Iron Man 2, CGI smash him up. Then you have Thor against the Destroyer, CGI smash him up. 
Yeah. Like Iron Man 3 CGI smash them up. It's, it, I don't think it's gotten to the later ones where you have Star Lord dancing or the Ant Man toy train battle that you have. Yeah, it's, they end up getting a little more creative with it again near the, you know, on some of those other movies. Yeah, you're right. But I guess this one, they didn't have that luxury. I mean, it's still an effective fight, but I forgot how much I, for, so I forgot pretty much everything about this final fight. I don't know if it was this, you, you just did a rewatch of this franchise and so did I, but I just keep, I always forget this fight, but I guess that's not bad because it's the first one of the MCU. Well, I think in terms of pure cinematic spectacle too. Yeah. I mean, it's not, it's not listed up there. Probably when you think of probably some of the more memorable ones, especially when they're throwing their budget at those final fights, Mm -hmm. whereas this one it is, it's, it's very much more reserved, but it's also it's in line with the rest of the movie too. Yeah, I would say because the movie, was, like the set pieces, were more being chased by the jets. More fi- this movie's mm-hmm. all about Iron Man figuring himself out because he's just developing the yeah. suit. I would say, but uh, but I guess with this fight scene, I mean, the first thing that happens is they get what slammed through the building and trucks. They wipe out the trucks. Obadiah does not care about. He was going to kill the family in the car. Yeah, and you have Iron Man saving it, and then she runs him over. That's kind of funny. That is funny. Like, he's got to do a, good... a push up to push the vehicle off of him. Like, he's just getting a, dragged. That's a good bit. Like that's a just a, his suit is low on power. He saves a family, then they run him over. And then every you know what's interesting. Uh, I guess I'm I've been a little down on this fight, but every second that he's being dragged by that car, it stresses me out because I'm just thinking eighteen percent, seventeen percent, sixteen percent, and it's it's stressing me out a little bit that knowing that it's draining him after he saved them. So, yeah, that did elicit an emotion right there. I think it's kind of funny, too, when you think of a superhero getting run over or an unfortunate character getting run over in general. They're never being dragged. It's just they get run over and they're spit out the back end. Like this one, his suit is like (laughs) caught on like the back bumper of this vehicle and she's just dragging him down the road. And I just love the moment where he's like, "I'm, I'm literally stuck. This vehicle's dragging me. And he just does a push up just to push the vehicle off of himself. Yeah, that, that's a good, and then that's he gets a good back gag. To it. That's a good gag, right? That's that's a good bit of this. I mean, I love when that happens, but then I guess where it it, it kind of he so he gets run over. Then Obadiah Stone kills a motorcyclist, knocks him into a bus, blows blows it up with a rocket launcher, and then which I love that just shoulder rocket launcher. I want one yeah. of those. How do we get that, Tom? I'm gonna have to call Tony, I guess. <laughs> just I guess we can't shoulder. call him now, but we can call Stark Industries and see what we can get. Or the Yautja Hunters get one of those laser guided ones. So do we shoot? They shoot up in the air, and that's a fun callback, right? That's you mm-hmm. have the moment earlier when he's on his own, flying, learning out his suit. So I mean, that's that's a fun bit, but I wouldn't say it's exactly. It's a good bit, but it's not exactly thrilling cinema, I guess. I love the I love the visuals though. Oh, the CGI in that like... when they're when they're launching up, especially when you've got kind of the the over Tony onto Ironmonger, and you see that huge like smoke smoke trail coming out of him and then he puts it into like the afterburners when he catches up to tony like i love that rocket i mean just that like the shot of him turning into a rocket more or less i just i think of i almost think of apollo 13 and yeah. it, you know and it taking off and that's just kind of i don't i doubt that's what they were aiming for but it's like yeah these guys are like almost trying to get into outer space hey boss uh, he can fly yeah i can see that <laughs> shut up jarvis I mean, you got Stan Winston and his crew designing all the the models in there, the special effects, and then you have what uh, the VFX ILM. So you have Stan Winston mm-hmm. Studios, you have ILM. It looks beautiful. Now this is 2008. We're we're thinking, and in, in this this is the time of Spider Man was getting there, right? But it's the the visual effects weren't quite there yet. I would say this is the biggest step up in regards to visual effects at the time. I mean, this looked beautiful. I would say in regards to yeah. a final fight. And, I, and, you know, I'm wondering if that's part of the reason that the final fight was also reserved. So it's like you I think they probably could have gone bigger, but I don't know if it would have been better. Yeah. I mean, the quality's there. I mean, 12 years later, I was looking in awe of this visual effects. And I also yeah. appreciated how they kept Pepper busy in it. She saved the day. She blew up the place. Then you have Rhodey helping out. It, it does keep the players in like it keeps them relevant, I guess. And it does help mm. tell the story, I think. What do you think Ironmonger landed on when he became an icicle? Did he kill some people? He must have. I was thinking about that actually when he when he 
he knocks him and he's, you know, he says something about like, you got to figure out the freezing problem, hits him and he falls back down. You never see him land. My first thought when rewatching this the other night was like, yeah, dude, he just made an impact crater 30 meters wide in the ground and probably land, you know, probably killed that car that he tried hitting Tony with earlier. Yeah. Like yeah. definitely some people died on that impact. So Tony took him up in the air and he falls and he probably murders people. Probably. But that's also superheroes learning too, right? You're, he didn't know he could fly and then he didn't know. So that's another interesting thing. I mean, the superheroes are just learning. And I was, I did some research, you know, Tim, Br Tim Rigby was the aerial stunt coordinator. This is the dude who did all the parachuting and stealth. He did the triple X base jump. This guy, if you look his name up, he's done the who's who of air air stunts. So that's a pretty good some pretty good air. But he wasn't gags. involved in drop zone. No, <laughs> no, he was not. But which we talked about. Listen to our terminal velocity and drop zone episode on movies of the flicks. But yeah, so I mean, Tim Rigby's legit. They brought in Thomas Robinson Harper, who has done who before this worked on Zathura with Favreau. He did Evolution, the stunt coordinator. He did Waterworld. If you look up the Waterworld stunts. Every stuntman in the world worked on Waterworld. Holy crap. But then yeah. he, he moved on to do Lone Ranger, Cowboys and Aliens, Iron Man 2, Winter Soldier, all the Guardians of the Galaxy movies. Uh, so, I mean, oh, also Tim Ribby did Batman vs. Superman. He was the stunt coordinator on that. So you got huge names creating this fight. But I guess, I, I know I'm repeating myself, but it tells a story, I guess, of Tony Smarts. And that's what you want since this is a Tony-driven story. Mm -hmm. So I guess the fight scene is quite successful in regards to character development. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's as you mentioned earlier, it's all about him learning and figuring out what he can actually do. And especially when he's limited and his suit's not, you know, it's not up to par, it's not at full power. And it's him being creative and literally using his intelligence to get out of a situation that he probably should die in. Yeah. Does it bother you when the the villains in the first and second one take themselves out of their suit so that it's readily like, available to be killed. You know how Jeff Bridges, so Jeff Bridges takes, uh, he's like, I'm going to kill yeah. you and they show him. And then they did that with Rourke too. Stay in the well, suit. Well, I think part of the reason he had to open up is because Tony destroyed his guidance system. <laughs> Which he tells so us he, too. <laughs> yeah. So he jumps up on his back and he says something like, you know, that looks expensive. Probably, that looks expensive. Yeah. And rips, I guess the guidance system out of his neck. And so he's, I, I don't know. I suppose he's forced them to open up his, his suit to have their, their sweet one-on-one -on -one dialogue and just show Jeff Bridges bald head more. That line though, you destroyed my, it's like, Ooh, that was, that felt pretty. Did you like that line? A little forced. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You're like, Oh brother. And then those flares, <laughs> did they just blind him? Were they so bright that the suit magnified him and he couldn't see? Is that what the flares did to him? I think so, yeah. I think the flares just messed up his tracking system because that was also before Tony ripped out the guidance system. Yeah. He's just squeezing so, him. Yeah, he's just he's giving him a, a good gentle hug and he's got to shoot flares into his face. Yeah. So yeah, I just I guess I just assume it probably messes up his system and he can't see. But I don't know why he just doesn't still continue to bear hug. He said he's, <laughs> his first reaction is to let go. Yeah, squeeze tighter. Close your eyes. You squeeze I, tighter. Yeah, I mean, dude, you listen, probably we've never been that in, fight. We've never we been in a metal have, suit, yeah. We but, don't have another 22 movies after that. Yeah, he just squishes him and then he becomes... Uh, <laughs> how and funny would that be if Jeff Bridges was Iron Man through this entire franchise? <laughs> and that's it. But I guess... All right, I guess just with this fight, it, it sets up Marvel, but... It, do you think it – okay, cause let's look at Spider-Man 1, the final fight, which we've covered on the podcast, was a fist fight, basically, between Green Goblin and Spider-Man. They're mm -hmm. in a thing just bloodying each other up. Spider-Man 2, it's more contained between Doc Ock and Spider-Man. Spider-Man 3 is in the skyscraper with about 47 villains, it feels like, you know, battling each other. But this one – do you think is there a way to avoid CGI smashups? So you have Man of Steel, Wonder Woman, this, Batman vs V Superman, Hulk, Thor. Is there is there a way to like you can't avoid these types of fights when you have no. two people in metal suits? No, I don't think you can. And it's it's kind of the the thing I've always thought about 